Welcome everyone. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Tom Ball. Tom, uh, I, Tom and I met, we went to essentially what's a computer science summer camp at a castle in Germany over the summer. Um, and we hung out for a week and talked uh, about a bunch of fun things. Um, and I extended the invitation if ever you're in the neighborhood, please come by to Maryland. We'd love to have you. We'd love to have you come give a talk to the ACIL. Flash forward a couple months, here we are. Um, Tom is a research partner at Microsoft Research. Um, I don't necessarily know what that title means, but uh, I'm going to I've been around a long time. Which means he's been around a long time. Um, Tom's work was initially in the area of uh, programming languages and, I think you'll see, um, defect detection in drivers and things like that, stuff I don't totally understand. Um, since then, he's shifted into um, designing programming environments for physical computing devices, particularly for kids. So he's very active in the design of Make Code, um, which is a programming environment designed for the micro bit. If people aren't familiar with the micro bit, it was co designed with um, BBC and Microsoft. Um, when I last checked, two million kids around the world had, been used, had learned to program with them. It's part of the required curriculum in England. So again, hundreds of thousands of kids are learning to program with Make Code. Um, so it's a, a cool example of people doing research and having immediate impact at scale. Um, so I think we're going to hear about that project and some other physical controllers and things like that. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tom. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, actually, in 1993, I interviewed in the CS department here. And I uh, had an offer from University of Maryland and also from Bell Labs, and I went to industrial research. Uh, sorry, 20, 26, 26, years in, 26 years and counting. I was at Bell Labs for six years, and I've been at Microsoft uh, 20 years. Primarily my area is programming languages, software tools for professional developers, but over the last five years, uh, there's a group of us who've been thinking more about end users, non-programmers, as well as beginning programmers and new programmers. So we've done that through a series of projects, um, and the latest has uh, been something that actually Microsoft has invested in. Uh, so this is joint work between Microsoft Research, Visual Studio that brings you developer tools. They have a, a team of developers there. And we also work with, from the Microbit project, as a result of the Microbit project, we work with uh, um, researchers of graduate student James Devine and Joe Finney at Lancaster University um, who work on firmware and runtime for embedded devices. Uh, so this is an outgrowth of what we did uh, with the BBC, uh, and I'll be demoing the microbit. So if you haven't heard of or seen the microbit, you'll, you'll get to play with it today. And the, uh, the website and everything that we do here is open source and free to use. Um, the devices are provided by our hardware partners. They generally are not free, but relatively inexpensive. Um, so everything you see here is the product of research, uh, Microsoft Research, joint work with the BBC, um, all open source uh, and, uh, and uh, software freely available. So the, the context that we were coming from was we had done a project called Touch Develop, and um, I have a smartphone here somewhere that's charging. And the idea of Touch Develop was when we grew up, uh, my generation, uh, we learned computing on hobbyist computers like the Apple II uh, and a smartphone, if we took it back to the days of the Apple II, this would be a supercomputer, right? way beyond any supercomputer you can imagine. But, it, but you couldn't program it. You could use it to consume, but you couldn't program it the way I programmed the Apple II. I programmed games on my Apple II, on my Apple II. So Touch Develop, the idea was we did research going back to syntax corrected editing and a bunch of ideas to allow you to program small programs for your touch phone on your, on your touch phone. And that's sort of what got us into education and eventually to embedded, um, was thinking about simplified programming models for sort of all the other devices we work with in the world. Uh, obviously, the smartphone's like a supercomputer we carry around with us, but more and more there are these uh, embeddable devices uh, that wearables, that are battery powered, and generally these things are really much more like my Apple II. In fact, the micro bit has three times less memory than my Apple II. My Apple II had 48K of RAM, and this has 16K of RAM. On the other hand, it has, I think, 256K of non-volatile flash, and its processor 
runs hundreds of times faster than the Apple II. So it's funny, like the Apple II, but very different. And generally, these things um, are programmed, embedded controllers are, are programmed using C and C++. If you do Arduino, who's experienced Arduino here? Right, and Arduino sketches, you generally program uh, a sketch in, in C. And so our challenge from the BBC uh, was they wanted to take a device like this, which they were thinking of as an IoT device, although this only has a Bluetooth capability, it can't go directly on, on the internet, but they wanted to be able to bring this to essentially 11-year-olds, year seven, which is like fifth graders, and they wanted to do this en masse for like a whole grade level in the UK, uh, with a programming environment uh, that was web-based. So you had sort of this disconnect. You had this world of the microcontroller with no operating system, very limited amount of resources, uh, but wanting to use modern tooling of the web browser to program this thing. Um, and so we had done this stuff with Touch Develop, and, and we came together and, and, and started thinking about that. Um, so the context is very interesting because as people who work on compilers and programming languages, compiling for these devices and making things fit in memory and run at acceptable speeds is a challenge. Also because a lot of these micro bits will be used in science projects, they wouldn't be powered like a Raspberry Pi from the wall, they'd be pi powered by batteries. And in a little science experiment where you're measuring temperature or humidity, you want it to run for a couple of weeks. So actually efficiency matters. Um, and so this is also why uh, the firmware experts uh, with CODAL and the operating system really thought about, we want to make sure we take advantage of low power mode and all these things, all this stuff, this complexity that we want to have the platform take advantage of so that the students can make productive use of these devices in whatever projects uh, their assignment school. So, so traditionally, uh, you know, Arduino has been the, the device of choice. In fact, the BBC did a lot of studies saying, why shouldn't we just use Arduino in the classroom? And um, uh, the Arduino Uno has even less memory than the microbit 2K K of RAM, only 32K of flash. But primarily, the reason that they chose not to go with the Arduino was that um, out of the box, it doesn't do much. It, it provides you a CPU and it provides you all these headers, but to do some, something with an accelerometer or an external display, you have to do wiring. And that's just more parts, that's more things to lose, that's more complexity for the teacher and the student. So while they liked Arduino and were inspired by sort of having the raw design that you can actually see the computer and you can see the leads and the wires and the pins, they chose really to go with a form of embedded computing which is uh, uh, more integrated. So this is the type of computer or embedded system that MakeCode also supports. I mean, we do compile for Arduino, not for the Uno. We used to, but um, there's not a lot of call so much for the Uno anymore. So the idea of the micro bit, as well as the circuit playground from Adafruit, which we also support, is you, 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 you have all the goodness of Arduino. You have all the pins and, and the capability to do GPIO and and I2C in the classical low-level interfaces, but there are integrated components on the board. So the microbit has a 5x5 five five LED array. So you can do like 1970s circa football game, or you know, you, you can scroll text across it. But really, the fact that you can just display out of the box is already a, a sort of a big advantage. You have two buttons, so you can type A and B. Uh, you, have, uh, you have an edge connector, so there's expandability like with the Arduino. Uh, you have an accelerometer and a temperature sensor and a magnetometer, so you have sensors on the back. And actually, one of the things they did that makes it really cool, and we'll do a demo, is they, they added Bluetooth. So it can actually communicate with other micro bits and even with a smartphone. And there's even an app you can program over the air wirelessly, uh, the micro bit. And the Adafruit took a different approach. Instead of having a sort of rectangular display, they have these beautiful RGB NeoPixels. Do people see the play with the NeoPixels, they're very popular in fashion, lighting up beautiful colors, they're very power hungry. But, uh, but uh, you can see again, uh, both these devices, uh, low amounts of RAM, a decent clock speed, um, nothing compared to your laptop or PC, but a host of, a host of integrated uh, sensors. So that's sort of the context. And here's like a bunch of the projects uh, that 
uh, that, uh, that we made for uh, the teachers and, and pro after school projects, just examples of things you can do with the micro bit. You, a lot of, the reason we call it make code is a lot of it is maker based. There's a making component here. There's an air guitar which actually makes noise when you shake it. This was actually uh, the micro bit embedded in a rocket car. This was another organization that did the rocket car, but we created the micro bit, a program to measure the XYZ accelerometer. Uh, accelerometer so if your car started to fly or a rock you could you could put the micro bit in it before and collect the data from the run and then bring it back so a lot of really interesting things that came out of uh, thinking about various uh, not just CS education but stem uh, here the micro bit is using the radio control over Bluetooth uh, to uh, control the car so a lot of great creative applications uh, for these uh, type of devices uh, and what we worked with the BBC on was uh, not just a set of projects but we created a CS intro uh, set of modules for to teach CS concepts as well. Uh, so the twin goals of make code and the underlying C++ runtime was to really, uh, like Arduino, uh, lower the barrier to creating with embedded systems. So. Uh, we wanted to have very low cost but capable hardware. That was actually sort of the BBC's idea and a really good, good idea. Uh, since this was going to be a, a classroom first activity, we knew that the software stack that we created and everything we had to do really had to just work in the classroom on existing computers without the installation of new applications or the inner session of an IT administrator. So uh, classroom computers are generally locked down in K through 12. Uh, it's very hard uh, to change that. Um, so uh, the fact that we were already doing touch develop as a web app was, uh, was great, but we actually had to go further as well because we had to think about how to get code onto the micro bit as well uh, as compile for it. The other thing that the BBC very much wanted because they knew a lot of students in primary school used Scratch was to support Blockly. Uh, out of the box, but because the, uh, the uh, exams at the middle school and the high school level in the UK require familiarity with the text-based language, they wanted uh, support for scripting languages. And so MakeCode right now supports essentially JavaScript, but we're also adding support for Python. And the microbit itself can be programmed with actually many other languages as well. The, the other thing though, and, and this, was, this was really part of uh, thinking about um, just like with Arduino and these sort of devices, we, we, wanted, we didn't want it to be just a monolithic sort of impenetrable tech that you could use for one thing and then had to buy another piece of tech to go on to the next thing. So we, we carefully designed layered APIs to support progression to more complex applications. So very simple way to get started as you'll see in programming, but all the low level APIs are there for Arduino style programming. Uh, Actually, uh, full object oriented programming, as you'll see using a JavaScript classes and efficient code generation using classical uh, techniques to make, uh, to make the user code fit uh, in, into small amounts of memory. Uh, and then uh, this edge connector on the micro bit was really key. They wanted to have a cheap way to get started out of the box, but extensibility. And this, this has really worked out well, but it required us in the design of make code to think about extensibility uh, in the software space to support the hardware space. Um, and the other aspect, which was really, uh, I think, a great, a great uh, concept of the BBC, they, they wanted networking out of the box. They wanted the, the idea that, well, it might not be on the internet, but you could connect the devices very quickly. And so uh, we've done a lot of work, and actually the radio stack, which I'll demo, is not Bluetooth, but there's an underlying broadcast protocol that allows you to create ad hoc networks of micro bits. Um, and so this was the sort of twin goal, sort of a low barrier to entry, but you know, high ceiling, a lot that you can actually do with it if you want to learn more. And with the C++ runtime, you can even go down and see at the very lowest level how to efficiently implement a little operating system uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're getting uh, uh, really curious. Okay, so let, let me do the first demo, which is sort of, you know, the zero to hero. Um, and the idea here is, is that, um, we want to make it super simple to get started so that people have a good experience you know, across uh, a wide range of devices. But we'll start with the micro bit so you see, the, see what that looks like. Um, so fundamentally, you get a micro bit. 
I have this hot pink USB cable that's not traditional, but it's the one I, I managed to find. I'm always putting these things away. Um, the micro bit, uh, well, first I'll, first I'll just show you the programming. So uh, 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 microbit.org is the, is the website for the Microbit Education Foundation, um, and they support Python through that, uh, as well as make code. Um, so if I, if, I, uh, if I look directly at the microbit, um, you can see, you can go to less code, there's the make code editor, which I'd already brought up, there's a Python editor, and there's a set of applications. Uh, but we also have the make code website, which supports a set of other, other devices. So here I've gone into the editor, I'm just going to do new project. And this web app actually contains everything one needs to work with the micro bit, both virtually on the screen in the simulator, as well as the actual device. So there's no need for an external compiler. We have a compiler all the way from Blockly to JavaScript to ARM assembly and ARM machine code in the browser with a pre-compiled C++ runtime, the CodeL runtime, as a blob that gets linked. So we, we create a binary in the browser. If we were to go off the internet right now, everything would still work. It's all loaded in the web app. Um, traditionally, this sort of uh, program to get started with is just uses event handlers. This would be familiar to you if you're using Scratch, so very high level. We're not doing polling like in Arduino, like sketches. We say, look, we have an A button. Uh, if button A is pressed, uh, we like to show people a happy, uh, we're, we're, we're happy, maybe we're, we're creating a motion. Uh, we're going to show our emotion to the world. So we have a wearable, we're going to put it around our neck. If button B is pressed, we're having a, not such a great day. Um, and you know, immediately we can take that program and we can you know, simulate it. And there's a debugger actually uh, still in beta, but you can actually single step and, and do all that. But what you see here is that uh, coming from the original BBC mandate, um, we not only do Blockly, but we can switch into, into text-based coding. And so this is one of the interesting things. There are a number of editors that support both text and blocks in different ways. Here we have actually two distinct editors, uh, but since we're compiler people, we try to go back and forth between each. Uh, here we're in the Visual Co Studio Visual VS Code Editor. It has IntelliSense, so if I want to say, okay, I want to do something on a gesture, I have code completion, uh, with the common shake gesture. Notice the shake button just came up there and the simulator started to react to the mouse. Um, and here, maybe I want to clear the screen, so clear screen. Okay, and I, I can do that coding and I can have a comment, hi all. And um, also, like, we'll come back to this, I can write a class, foo, here, and I can press the button and go back to blocks. Now, what you'll see here is that uh, we know how to translate the shake event back. Uh, the class foo, is retained in the block, but it's uneditable because we don't have the blockly uh, primitives translated to do that. So the code is maintained between the two representations, um, but uh, you have that. Um, also noticed in the text, we still have the same toolbox. So um, if I forgot an API, you know they're they're here as well, and I can I can drag those. So we this is actually interesting. We haven't done any user studies here, but we've been wondering if like learning with Blockly and then coming over here, is this useful or not? We don't really know yet. We actually don't see a lot of people even even trying to drag and drop text. So we sort of think right now people just get focused on the text editor and they forget that there's this whole toolbox there. Um, okay, so anyway, you see the, you see the program now, uh, zero to hero. So now we've got the program running in the web browser. Um, the shake event, again, uh, can be done by sh shaking the mouse there or, or pressing the little virtual button. So now, um, we're, let's look up a micro bit. And uh, here it is. Uh, the micro bit can be connected uh, and powered over uh, USB. Okay, so there it is, and we heard a little something. We're going to download, so it actually is doing the compile, uh, and uh, that will show up as a file in my folder. The micro bit should be there. Oh boy, you probably can't see it. It's in the very lower, uh, here, let me see that, if that helps. Uh, yes, there it is. It's a drive. Wow, the, the resolution is just not, uh, not great. Um, okay, I'm gonna take, uh, I'm gonna take my, uh, if I can find it now, I'm gonna take my uh, uh, download, what I had, uh, uh, 
that the one? Yeah, I think so. And we're going to drag it back to the microbit drive. OK, and start just a file copy. So the microbit basically tells every operating system, I have a mass storage device, sort of. There's not really a file system there, but it's pretending to be one. And it turns out that's, uh, that's pretty, uh, pretty good uh, across most major operating systems. So then you can see I'm, I'm happy, I'm sad, shake, and neutral. Um, so let me just show you then that it's resident, and then you know it's it's working on it's working on battery power. So there we go. And you can you can see that. I'm not going to pass it around right. Now. Oh no, I actually I'll wait till the next time. So I'll pass that around. You can try it. Um, that's the basic program. So that's sort of zero to hero, right? That's um, the demonstration there. Is just you know it's super simple to get started with. There's the block-based programming. It's at a very high level. It's event-based. You don't even know there's an accelerometer. There's like, oh, somehow it detects shaking. Well, how did you, how did you do that? Well, there's a set of input mechanisms. And you know, down here, you can go and you can actually read you know, the accelerometer. And even lower level, you can go to the accelerometer over I2C. So there's, you know, uh, um, again, in, in thinking about progression, we started with very simple APIs at the high level, event-based, abstract, uh, and then you know, we layer them. So you can, you can go down, you can do polling, um, you can discover other devices as well. Uh, the tech isn't just about, I mean, an end-to-end -end experience isn't just about great software and hardware, it's also about having projects. So we have tutorials, we have games, we have uh, fashionable things, make, you, makes you can do, uh, we have a bunch of STEM uh, stuff, and uh, there are courses. So there's intro to CS, uh, this has been three years now, so we've accumulated quite a bit. Uh, Sean Heimel, who's a great guy, worked for SparkFun, does these videos about the hardware. If you really want to learn what's an LED, um, we have another teacher working on these coding cards. So we've there's a big community now uh, that's really uh, come around the microbit, especially as it's been global. Uh, and uh, the microbit is also uh, is also um, uh, been localized. So you. It's in different languages, different countries uh, as well. So, any questions sort of about that basic experience and what we're after? OK. Um, so, so here's what you just saw. So we're sort of bridging the, the divide between the world of the web with you know, browser and scripting languages and Blockly and this low, this low resource uh, devices. So, what we generally do is we stand up for each device partner a website. <coughs> and so we have different ones. We have uh, one for the mic mic microbit, one for Adafruit. But essentially, they're the same web app, just parameterized uh, differently. So we, all of them have both the dual editors, Blockchain JavaScript. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what really allows us to do JavaScript and compile it to a uh, low resource device. Oh, thank you. Um, that's called static TypeScript. As you saw, within the web browser, we have a simulator. We believe like it's great to test before you deploy, because a lot of these things, and I think this is an important part about physical computing, you actually are taking the program off of the PC and putting on this device and putting it into an environment where you may not be able to update the program. So that's quite different than Scratch, where the program always runs in the web browser and everything is a peripheral that's controlled by the computer. So in, in the case of physical computing, I think it's, it's really important that you think about testing your program and using the simulator, we do pretty good functional testing before you put the code onto the board. And for that, we have this compiler uh, that goes to machine code and links against the pre-compiled uh, C++ runtime. So that's what you saw. Uh, for the microbit, if you, if you go to makecode.adafruit.com, you'll see a very similar editor. It's skinned differently, but it has the same basic capabilities. So, so these are the innovations. Basically, I would say four innovations that we, that we have. Uh, the web app for the end-to-end -end experience with the in-browser compilation to the binary is pretty unique. There's others that, that do generation of bytecode, but you still have an interpreter. The interpreter has overhead, and it turns out that when you want to go to games and other programming, like the interpretation overhead and the memory overhead 
uh, of the interpreters. There's a lot of interpreters for microcontrollers for like scripting languages like Python, which are great. And in fact, you can almost some of them even have the whole compiler on the board, so you can just send it program text. But we felt compiling in the in the browser to binary would give us like the best use of the resources and best battery life. And, and we've seen that it's, it's, it's also worked out well for performance. Uh, and I'll show you that in the game machine later. Um, we chose TypeScript as our core language. If you don't know about TypeScript, it's a gradually typed version of uh, JavaScript. And actually, TypeScript now, a subset of it we call it static TypeScript, is really like object-oriented programming in Java or C-sharp. So if you're thinking about uh, using make code, uh, you don't have to do, do it in Blockly. You can do full object-oriented programming with inheritance and interfaces, just like you would be used to in Java in make code. So there's a full OO system in there, which is quite rich. And I, a lot of people uh, don't, don't know that. But stat, TypeScript is also the implementation language for our entire web app. TypeScript is also the glue between, and uh, I think this might be of interest, is the glue between the world of C++ and the world of Blockly. So we actually have a way to associate metadata with TypeScript interfaces that generates automatically the blocks for us. So we um, are programming language people, so we think of everything as a programming language compilation problem. So the problem of working with Blockly, which is a big framework, is more a problem of describing which functions you want to make into blocks, and then having the blocks just appear for you. Uh, the Codal is this efficient C++ runtime done by Lancaster University. It supports really this high-level model of programming with events over a message bus, and actually it supports concurrency via coroutines. So in, in the runtime, we don't have true concurrency. We have uh, non-preemptive scheduling, so every fiber can yield. But this gives us a lot of flexibility and efficiency, um, and especially when you want to have multiple, the illusion of multiple handlers running uh, concurrently, like you do in Scratch, as a matter of fact. We have the same model. And so that's essentially our runtime, uh, essentially can, can stop any, uh, can, can uh, pause things and restart them. But it's, uh, but, uh, it's not racy, it's deterministic. Uh, and then the final thing, which is pretty low level, is you know how do you actually copy? How do you actually make a device appear as a as a disk across all these different operating systems? It turns out the traditional way that that's been done for dev boards in the embedded space was really fragile. So we came up with a new file format that makes it much more robust and faster to flash devices over USB. And everything we do here, I show the links. Everything here is open source. In fact. Uh, the file format, UF2, that's been adopted by Adafruit. So Adafruit, all their bootloaders now support UF2, and uh, most of their devices, uh, as a result, work with make code uh, because they, they support the format that, uh, that we created uh, as part of this uh, work, having to work in the classroom. Okay, so I'm going to talk, talk a little, because I'm a language person, about static TypeScript, but then I'll go back to some demos to show you uh, particularly um, particularly uh, how we uh, work with Blockly. Um, so how many people know what TypeScript is? I guess I just told you. How many people have actually worked with TypeScript? OK, so TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. It's JavaScript where you add types, but you don't have to put types anywhere. So any JavaScript program is a TypeScript program, but in TypeScript, you can start to sprinkle type annotations in. And why is that useful? It's useful because if you have a really big program, the types help with IntelliSense and code structuring and all sorts of things in languages like C++ and Java and C Sharp. You take for granted that types sort of help you, not just from a soundness viewpoint, but from a productivity standpoint. So what we did is we took TypeScript and we said, well, that's nice. It's got types because um, we want to have the IntelliSense and the capability to generate blocks and it's hard if you just give me a JavaScript interface to say, what should the block be for that? If, you, if on the other hand, you know that it returns a number, we can say, oh, that should be a, a value block in block. I, I can't remember the name of the blocks. Or that should be a statement block. And, and furthermore, if you want to compile the job, our JavaScript to C++ and link it against C++, it's much better that you know what the types are. So, so static TypeScript, it's static for several reasons. One, it, it has static typing. Uh, it removes many of the dynamic control flow mechanisms of JavaScript, the bad parts, like eval and 
and also gets rid of the prototype inheritance chain. So there's only nominal, uh, nominal OO programming, just like classically in Java or C Sharp, and that enables us to use classic compiler optimizations, uh, classic compiler techniques like the V table. And then what we do is all the APIs we write for the microbit, everything we write is fully typed. Um, and so, so now, because it's fully typed, when you're typing in the editor, it looks like you're just typing JavaScript with no types because you're usually running against, you're usually typing against typing, coding against a typed API. Since we know the types, TypeScript infers the types for your variables, so it just looks like you're writing JavaScript. Um, and then, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other goodness that TypeScript gives us in its language service and the editor that, that we inherit. But fundamentally, static TypeScript serves two purposes. Types give us more information for generating the blocks, and also during compilation, it, 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 it gives us a, a way to do foreign function interface to C++, uh, and it gives the intelligence. So, but we also just love static types, because we're just that sort of people. That's what we grew up on. But we, we really feel for productivity, uh, in touch develop we use static types, because if you're typing with one finger, it's really good to know the context, and types help you. Okay, so there's a bunch of tooling that we've created in MakeCode that leverages static TypeScript. I'm only gonna tell you about one part, which is how we leverage static TypeScript to generate all the metadata you need to do the blocks. But we have three, three other things that make the full experience you saw complete. One is we need to, from static TypeScript, generate JavaScript. Well, that sort of sounds funny because we're already in JavaScript. Why do we compile the JavaScript? It's because JavaScript, the runtime single thread. But remember, we want these coroutines. So we need to compile to a continuation passing style, which is a, a fancy way of saying that we want our JavaScript to be pausable and resumable. And there's a, sure, I'm Christian Murphy has this nice paper called Stopify. Like, like in JavaScript, you don't, you don't want your GUI to hang because your program has an infinite loop. You still want the GUI to be reactive. So in, so in essence, we need to make sure every loop can be paused by our runtime. So, so we compile to this plausible JavaScript, uh, start restartable, stoppable, restartable, and then we also have to, um, we also have to uh, somehow interface C++ and, and TypeScript together. Um, that's another story. And then of course we have to take static TypeScript and compile it down all the way to machine code. But um, this is uh, this is really uh, talking then now about. Uh, how do we support Botlockly? So let's, uh, oh, yeah, let's go to a demo. Um, so if you go back, where's my web browser? If you go back to, my, to the web browser, uh, and let's look at our little program. Uh, yeah, there it is. And you go to JavaScript. Once you're in JavaScript, you're getting closer to the goods, which is how is all this stuff implemented. And you know what? Let me change the resolution here. Yeah, that's, that's a bit better. Okay, so... Um, so over here, you can see uh, there's a bunch of stuff hiding. And what's hiding in here is, uh, is the TypeScript that is defining a bunch of the runtime for the microbit. So the runtime, there's this codal. Think of that as the very minimal operating system written in C++. Um, but then there's a bunch of stuff we write ourselves in static TypeScript. Uh, and that's things that can be exposed as blocks. So what you see here is you see an API that's, uh, that's static TypeScript. It's exporting a function. Uh, and you can see it's typed. It takes a value. Uh, and then you see this funny syntax above here. And this is essentially saying, I want a block for this. OK. Uh, and one of the interesting things here is we, we give a, an ID. This means if we change, if we change aspects of the block attributes, it has the same ID, so old, program, old projects keep working. But essentially, you know, in Blockly, the, the key idea is how are you going to expose the block as text? So there's a way to, to specify that. And there's a whole set of other metadata. And the, the idea then is when you come up to blocks and you look in the basic namespace, there's show number, right? right. And, and that, that block, when it compiles, is going to compile as a call into that static TypeScript function. Okay, so this is really nice, and I can just show you this at work. 
Um, I've been working on my own set of APIs for a little game engine. And in that, you know, um, I, uh, I, I, I've been writing, you know, uh, I've been writing something. I set tile map, you know, I, if I look over in the other tab, um, and I go uh, to blocks, oh yeah, it's going to give me an error because I'm, I'm debugging probably. Yeah, let me just get rid of that for now. Go back to blocks. I'm, I'm doing this thing called tile world, and tile world has this block I've defined called set tile map to. But, you know, I don't really like the name of that, so I come over to this uh, editor where I have the definition of set tile map, and I'm like, yeah, let's just say I want, I want that to be set, set map. Right, and also, oh, you know, maybe I actually want. There's, I forgot. There's like some, there's some extra argument here. Uh, uh, it's called funny. It's a funny number. Uh, maybe it's going to be zero, and you know, I want that. I want that to also uh, appear. Right. So now I've done that. I switch back to the editor. It basically reads in that API. There's a little processing. Uh, that goes on here, and now, boom, I have a new block. So, as a programmer of uh, um, a new set of APIs for a device or whatever, I don't have to know about Blockly very much. I basically have a little metadata, I run in, I write static TypeScript, it's going to give me Blockly, and it's going to compile down and link with C++. So this is like a huge, huge advantage we have in Minka. Yeah? Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, is it possible to source external TypeScript from so. um, Well, from you, do you just mean external TypeScript? Yeah. You mean load it? Yeah, and here you are creating your own TypeScript. I want to load another TypeScript from. So. Yeah, well, we have to be very careful. Now, static TypeScript is in a sandbox, but like the microbit organization, they don't want any old TypeScript coming in, including the namespace. So they have a whitelist. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to this in a, 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 a second, which is extensions. So anybody can write an extension for any one of our devices. You can do that using GitHub, and we can pull the code off of GitHub, and you can load it into your own editor. Now, will somebody else be able to do that? Only if they know the name. And But if you want to be in, in an approved list of extensions, um, so the answer is yeah, you can do it, but for users, it's they're going to have to be more knowledgeable. They're going to actually have, and they're going to take on you know whatever responsibility. But yes, we have a way to extend to any editor with static TypeScript, and I'll, I'll show that in a second. So what I'm showing here is just like the idea of of writing for embedded systems just from your web browser uh, is really key. And so just let me show you how that surfaces for the microbit. So for the microbit, we have many hardware partners. Uh, the best way to sort of see the success of that is, you know, go to Amazon.com, uh, search for microbit, and you just you just will see not just the microbit for sale, but you will see, you know, a whole host of uh, actually that's an Uno kit, it's a <coughs> micro starter, so that's a, that's a Amazon problem. But you'll see, uh, you should see like a bunch of, you know, other other things available. Yeah, so here's a starter kit for 39 bucks, right? Now, some of these uh, additions to the microbit are actually going to, you're going to plug into them like a motor uh, assembly or a car. How is, how is the program going to communicate with those? Well, it's going to do it over essentially a standard a protocol like I2C. So um, that's a, that's a bus-based protocol for extending the capabilities of a microcontroller. So if you go to extensions here, you know, you say like, oh, yeah, yeah, I want to add a car to my micro bit, and it goes and searches and says, oh yeah, you know, here are these buggies, and here's this thing called the Gigglebot. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll go get the Gigglebot. So give me the package for that. So that package has been, been whitelisted by the micro bit, and you see we get a Gigglebot namespace with the Gigglebot blocks, right? And if we uh, know, you know, because we're smart now, we know about how to go look at it, we can go, uh, we can go here, and we can find, oh, there's Gigglebot, and you see, it's actually, that's coming, uh, since we have that versioning, it's coming from GitHub. So that code was just pulled from GitHub, 
Uh, if there's a refresh to it, we can refresh it here. But the cool part about this device is that the extension is completely written in static TypeScript. And that's because we provide I2C interface, right? So I was talking about like the lowest common denominator, right, for Arduino and for these devices is these low-level protocols. So all of that, we have uh, APIs written in static TypeScript, right, so that you can interface, uh, you can interface to our runtime, uh, but you, um, you don't have to write a single line of assembly or, or, or a C++. Now, of course, does the Gigglebot show up in my simulator? No, that would be a lot of extra work, right? But you can, um, uh, you can still do single step debugging and all the sort of things. So this extension mechanism has really been great. We've, we've converted a whole bunch of hardware vendors from writing C++ to just writing static TypeScript. And again, I think that's also a testament to the choice of, of a language that essentially is like a, a C++ style language. It's nominal types. They look at it, it's, oh yeah, there's enums, there's classes, there's functions, yeah. And they just write the code, right? So this has actually, I think, been a really, a really a good part of the experience because we've really expanded from outside the microbit from doing just the microbit to a platform that supports many devices, but also for each device we want to be able uh, to support uh, uh, to support uh, extensions. Yes. So that was my that was my next slide. Um, so yeah, extension is just what you saw. It's a static uh, TypeScript library. It can have C++ in it, but then it gets a lot more complicated. We actually have to go to a server to compile the thing. There has to be a binary blob for that thing. It's so much simpler if it's pure static TypeScript. Often the stuff is uh, associated with the hardware peripheral, but not always. Like one teacher wanted to uh, make an extension to add blocks to do, I don't know, counting in binary using the LED screen or something. So they created like a little library. So it, you know, it's just a way to create libraries, so they don't have to be associated with hardware. Um, but we've also been, we also have exp experiments, which is sort of our way of doing uh, A-B testing. So if you go, and this is sort of harder to discover because we don't want the students in the classrooms getting too distracted. If you go to the About page and you do to go to Experiments, you see there's all sorts of stuff we've got um, we've got going on. There's a debugger, which is pretty much ready to mainstream now. We have download over Bluetooth for, with Web, Web BLE as a, an emerging standard. We have a way to take screenshots of your simulator and all sorts of things you can just enable or disable. So for the researchers and you, like if, if you wanted to work with us and try something out, often we'd put you in an experiment section, but you could potentially get access to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, potentially, of users who are using the micro bit. Of course, we'd have to, they'd have to somehow discover this. So again, but for doing like a, a study where, you know, you want to deploy an idea, study it a little bit, and then uh, be able to uh, take it back and refine it, that's what we have the experiments for. So yeah, so th this is also part of being in research, but also delivering a product. Like we as researchers also want to iterate on the next thing. Uh, and so we've been doing uh, quite a bit of that. In fact, what I want to show you next is sort of what, what research has incubated over the last year, uh, which is sort of the next, uh, the next phase. How, how am I doing on time, by the way? 14 minutes. 14 minutes, wonderful. Okay, perfect. Um, right, so, so far the model has been as follows. We go out and somebody's created some hardware, like the BBC, the microbit, Adafruit, the circuit playground, and then we create an editor for it. Huh. And the next piece of hardware comes out, it's like, oh, we have to do this work again. Wouldn't it be better if we turned it around? Like, we're going to define the hardware, and then, then all these folks are going to build to our specs. Sort of sounds like good Microsoft model, like PC and Windows, right? Wouldn't it be nice? So we we're doing that, but for a very tiny PC. Okay, so imagine instead of 16K of RAM, you have 100K of RAM. You can actually do a game now because you can support a little 160 by 120 screen. So the next thing we've been doing in research uh, is browser-based game development because this is how a lot of us got started. And if you go to arcade.makecode.com, you can see this. Uh, and it won't be a big surprise because I actually showed you it already. It was over here, but there's all sorts of bugs in it because uh, I'm, I'm developing some new things. But essentially, we have a little game machine. Uh, and that game machine, uh, when if, if we do download, here's the cool part, is supported by a whole set of devices. So we've inverted things. First you go to the web browser. If you don't have any of these machines, 
It's cool anyway, because you can run the thing in the browser. You can program a game in Lockley or TypeScript. You can use classes. Uh, you can make your game just like you would in Scratch and just stay in the browser and be happy. But we have all these hardware partners who've come up with compatible hardware. And so we have like the Meow bit, uh, which, is, which is cool because look what it has on the bottom. Do you recognize that? It's the microbit edge game. Because they're they've been doing microbit peripherals. So they're like, we're gonna make a game machine that also is a microbit. It's like, okay, this is cool. And we're sort of seeing the innovation. Adafruit had done something, a, a badge, uh, BrainPad Arcade is over here. Uh, also, we have instructions on how to we, we work with Raspberry Pi. If you want to make it a little arcade cabinet, we can we you can run on a Raspberry Pi. So here this has been really interesting because now we've gotten into hardware design. And in fact, one of our team members uh, is an electrical engineer and was sort of pushing us, like, why don't we go do that? So what we've done here that's different is we've created our own hardware reference design that's compatible with the set of APIs and the capabilities <laughs> we have in our virtual game machine. Uh, and we have a, a minimal set of requirements, and we're just, the hardware partners are like, hey, if, if you, if you have this type of CPU and a USB with the UF2 download, you know, it'll, it'll, it should just work. And then, of course, uh, here is really where static type script shines. The entire game engine, the only thing that's really in C++ for the game engine is the blit to the screen. Take an image, take a buffer, put it to the screen. That's in C++ for performance. The whole game engine, physics, everything else is all in static type script. So this is also where we really where our compiler uh, really helps out. Because an interpreted approach, we just would not be able to get the frames per second rate that we have. So yeah, that, that's what we've got. It's a retro game machine. It's, it's a retro arcade, 160 by 120 pixel screen, 15 colors plus transparency, <laughs> four buttons, uh, two action buttons, uh, a little sound, uh, and, um, and basically uh, uh, we can run in 96 uh, 96 uh, kilobytes of memory, uh, so with double buffering of the screen. Uh, although we prefer to have a little more RAM. And generally, we're as you see here, uh, the micro bit is a Cortex M0 class. Now we're going to a Cortex M4. So uh, we have we have a better process, you know, a faster processor. Uh, so this is what uh, uh, so this is what this is what we've been doing, and and really it's it's worked out quite well from our sort of experience doing the micro bit. Uh, people see that we're serious about making the hardware and software work really well together, uh, and we've we've had a, a a a number of people just come to us and say, "Hey, look what I made! Uh, you know, is this you know can can I add this to the the list of compatible boards?" So this has been uh, this is this has been uh, this has been quite an quite an interesting experience. And then out of the blue uh, came the kitten came the meow bit, uh, and there's another one. Uh, some meow bits in China. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the boom team uh, has a whole set of game controllers. They game things. They they took one in and and made it as well. So this has been an interesting experiment because now we're sort of in the hardware design business as well as thinking about uh, um, as thinking about the software stack. Okay. So um, uh, what I've shown you today is really you know what what we try to do with make code. Uh, inspired first by the classroom, but now actually going a little bit outside. And if I have some time, I can tell you about future work. Uh, it, is to really do, is to bridge this gap between the web at the top, where your web app has plentiful RAM, you're working in JavaScript or TypeScript, you have these great frameworks like Blockly, uh, and at the bottom, you have these microcontrollers, which, you know, if you're lucky, you have 100 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, there, you have no operating system. Uh, you know, the world of programming them is generally C and the pro dev. And so what we've really been doing, as I, I hope you see today, is to use a, a bunch of programming language uh, technology as well as the web uh, frameworks uh, to really make it easier to program these microcontrollers uh, for complete beginners, but to provide a progression path both in the programming domain by going to object-oriented programming as well as extensibility for hardware partners uh, and I didn't talk. I didn't get to talk about networking, but if we have time, uh, uh, I will. I'll stop now and, and uh, take any questions. How much are the meow bits? Uh, 
I guess we should just ask the web. I think they're 25 bucks. I'm pretty sure it's a little Okay, 34 bucks. Also, they have a beautiful case. They, they did this for the micro bit. I don't know what the synthetic is, but it's really like, like you have a cat. It's like, it's so <laughs> nice. It's got the little ears, you know, it doesn't bite you. You don't have to feed it. Any other questions? Yeah. Like, using this device, is there a way to like learn on low level languages? You mean like machine language? Yeah, like, um, like for example, R language or Nets. Yeah, so that's a, that's, a, that's a very good question. I mean, um, we don't have explicit support for it, but if you do go, uh, if you do go uh, back to our, um, if you do go back to our, our program here, and uh, hit the download button again, and uh, yeah, just get rid of that. And, uh, where are we? Sort of, this, this all confused me. Uh, yeah, if we go down here to build, yeah, so there's the assembly, so you can at least see like the assembly that's been generated, but you can't edit it. So if you really want to go down and learn the C++ of the runtime or do assembly coding, um, you're going to have to use a different programming environment. So part of our plan is to have a transition into VS Code, where a lot more tooling can be embedded and downloaded you know, directly. But yeah, I mean, it's there. I mean, we have an assembler. It's in the web app, but you know, we don't have we don't have breakpoints at the assembly level, and we're yeah, we're not simulating that in the web browser. But we are creating those artifacts. Is your compiler open source? Yeah, yeah, the whole thing is open source. The compiler is open source. Yeah, so we take the TypeScript abstract syntax tree mm -hmm. and lower it to an intermediate representation, and from that we can generate the plausible JavaScript or go to assembler, and that yeah, that's all open source. Um, so when we use an Arduino or anything, um, the main thing which attracts us is because we can do, um, I mean, we can join different hardware to it. Mm -hmm. So can we join that to the microwave? Yeah, so there is limited support for that. Um, there's, the question was about adding things. Um, you can certainly, on the micro bit, there's an edge connector. And on that edge connector, you have GPO, GPIO, I2C, SPI. So there's, everything is available there. The, the editor has some very uh, basic support uh, for things for devices that aren't um, uh, that aren't on board the computer. So there's no um, speakers. So for example, if you go here and you say music play tone, um, what you'll see on the screen is that it says, "Oh, take your headphone and connect the tip and this part to zero and ground." So actually, so now that, that little wiring diagram, it's super popular. And, and the great thing about that is the kids put it in their ears, and you have 20 kids all doing that, and you don't hear a sound. Imagine if they're, yeah, they're, at, they're yeah, okay. So the, the other thing I will say is on the research side, we've taken that much further. This is not part of the product, but it's our experimental playground. And here, you can do Arduino-style programming with, uh, with any one of a number of boards, so um, let me see, blank or something like that. And so here what you see is where we have, like everybody with our Arduino board comes to us and says, but I want make code for that. We're like, yeah, just tell us what the pin mapping is and, we'll, and give us an SVG and we'll add it. So for example, somebody comes up and they say, oh yeah, yeah, well, do you work with the blue pill? And it's like, yeah, we support STM, sure, sure we support the blue pill. Now what does that really mean? Uh, well, it means, yeah, we have a very basic SVG. It, it, means, uh, it, it means if I go and I do digital write, we have a set of components we've associated to the APIs. And so we basically will do Arduino 101 for you in the simulator, right? So the nice part is here, we support like, I don't know, at this point, 50 different boards. Each one of them is described by a very little file that says, Here's the SVG, here's where the pins are, here are the names of the pins, here's the capability of each pin. And we just have a map that says, yep, yep, I got an API for that. And then for digital write, you know, we use an LED. Oh, got to put a resistor in line, so do that. And then for, uh, you know, digital read, 
let me see. All right. Oh yeah, let, let me show you something. Something a little nicer. Uh, where's, where's the motor? Server right pin, yeah, let's do that. Maybe we should really put it on a different pin. Yeah, we have a, a set of components that, that we support out of the box. Okay, maybe that's not gonna work. Um, let's try. Uh, put it on a, uh, okay. All right, that's not working for whatever reason. But yeah, we do, we have this breadboard support uh, and we have the ability to generate, uh, generate the, you know, the, the pin mapping that corresponds to the program. Okay, just really quickly, in the interest of time, uh, we just have one more question and then we just break for the uh, afternoon. Uh, yeah. Any last questions? Last question? Um, yeah. yeah um, was it a design decision to limit the number of GPIOs or was it a hardware limitation? You mean on the micro bit? Uh huh. Oh, um, I don't really remember the, what is the number on it anyway. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the pin connector, it, if you see it has, the, it has the big pins, but it has, I think every available one that can be is allocated. Some of the GPIO probably is not because the LEDs take up quite a bit, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, the microbit design was to try to pack as much goodness into the board as well as have it external. So some of the things are reused. So for example, like I think some of the buttons, also there's a pin, so you can have like, you can create your own button A out here in place of this button A. So, um, yeah, it's the basic chip and the, the set of, you know, things they decided to put on board. But, but don't, don't, but there's more than the big pins. There's, there's tiny little ones in there. That's why you need an edge connector. Yeah. Okay. Let's sign up speaker, everyone.